Welcome back. You're listening to Nate the Hate on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcast. Be sure to like the video and subscribe if you haven't already, and be sure to ring that notification bell so that you are notified each time we have a brand new episode to go live on YouTube. And I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Modern Vintage Gamer, who is celebrating two big milestones this month. One, the release of Shantae on the Nintendo Switch, and I'd like to wish him a very happy 48th birthday. Thank you, Nate. Thanks for having me on. That was a really, really great intro. I appreciate it. Yeah, a um, couple of things have been happening in my world. The release of Shantae, go ahead and check it out if you haven't already. I made a video talking about the the whole process, how it all went down, how I was approached by Limited Run Games and Way Forward to make that game or to be involved in the making of that game. Um, answers a lot of questions. I know a lot of people that were aware of my involvement in the game, wanted to know more about it. So check that out. And yeah, I celebrated my 48th getting older, but uh, still feel pretty young on the inside. So that's the most important thing. Or age is just a number. It's all about how you feel and live. That's ex- absolutely correct. <laughs> and today's episode is dedicated to Wisecorn01, whom generously donated $115 to the channel. Thank you for your generosity and support. And they are today's dedicated fan. And today's topic is going to be Nintendo's upcoming fiscal year report. They are due to give an update on their sales data in just over a week on May 6th or May 7th, depending on your time zone. And we will know how Nintendo finished their prior fiscal year where they had ambitious hardware goals. And they also had a lot of ambitious software released over the course of that fiscal year. And despite some of our concerns last year of Nintendo being very reluctant with information, They certainly turned things around in the second half with releases such as 3D All-Stars, Paper Mario, Hyrule Warriors, Age of Calamity, and they had the evergreen giant known as Animal Crossing. And we're going to discuss some of our predictions of what Nintendo is going to come in with the sales data of those games. But first, we're going to start with the hardware. As of the end of December... The Nintendo Switch has sold 24.1 million units in that fiscal year, and this already exceeded Nintendo's revised hardware projections. They started the fiscal year with a forecast of 19 million units. They revised it to 24 million units, and then they increased it to 26.5 million units. And based on the sales data that we have seen thus far to begin 2021, I feel as though Nintendo is going to surpass that figure and could potentially close out the year above 27 million pieces of hardware sold to the end of November, to the end of March. I think that will surpass it. And I think 27 is, is a good number to, to leave it at. I mean, I think, you know, we did have some questions. I mean, I remember we talked about this this time last year and, you know, we were wondering, you know, how is Nintendo going to go? You know, um, are they going to be affected by COVID? Do they have the, you know, the staying power to sell those units? And like you said, I mean, they came really good in the second half of the year. Big credit to them. And look, the Switch just continues to sell in and... I think 27 is is a really good number to to come back with to to you know to speculate that that's how much they've they've sold. Yeah, they could definitely eclipse that number. It's tough to gauge cuz right now the sales data that is public is mostly just out of Japan. We can look at how the platform is performing in that region and it is outperforming what it did up to this point compared to 2020 and a large reason for that is the popularity of Monster Hunter Rise, but it's also Nintendo's evergreen software with Animal Crossing, Smash Brothers. You know, they're leading the way in Japan. And you've also had a kind of of out-of-nowhere surprise from Konami Mm -hmm. with Momotaro, which has sold upwards of, I believe, almost two and a half million copies in the region. 
And Nintendo really just has a vice grip on Japan right now. And they are above the hardware sales as far as pacing goes compared to this time of 2020 and 2021. We don't know specifics when it comes to the European and North American regions for sales, but we know Nintendo is performing very well, especially in North America. They lead the NPD, I believe, every month so far this year. Maybe one may have gone to the PlayStation 5. I'd have to check prior NPD reports. But Nintendo's momentum isn't slowing down. And when we look to 2020, some of it was accelerated due to COVID. We had quarantine. People were looking for outlets. And one of the best outlets during quarantine was video games. And Nintendo happened to release Animal Crossing at that perfect time where people wanted some sort of social interaction. And Animal Crossing gave you that virtual societal aspect. Mm -hmm. You were able to connect with friends, visit their town, you know, interact with each other. And while Nintendo doesn't have a game of that caliber right now, they do have Monster Hunter, which is exceeding expectations, especially in the West where up until Monster Hunter World really wasn't, I don't want to say it wasn't that popular. It had some popularity, but now it's been elevated. And like Monster Hunter is a legit worldwide franchise now. And that's why Monster Hunter Rise has already shipped upwards of 5 million copies in, you know, less than a month. And that's definitely playing the role as to why the Switch hardware is performing so strongly in early 2021. And I'd say 27 million units could potentially be lowballing what we actually get. Could be. From the- I mean, it, it could it could be a lot higher than that. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's just so hard to know. But I mean, I think if anything has been consistent, you know, every time we've we've gone through this in in previous episodes, it's that they always seem to exceed expectations. So they they could well be. 28.5 you know 20 even 29 wow. i mean i mean that's we're getting quite aggressive at that point but they could <laughs> really have sold a lot more than what we actually think yeah i mean if if they flirt with 29 they're getting into ds level performance yep or even like high end wii performance which i'm not going to put you know out of the realm of possibility but you know i think a safe conservative estimate would be 27 to maybe 28. Yeah. Which, I mean, for Nintendo to have to, you know, revise their forecasts three times and still exceed expectation, that's nothing short of amazing. And that's really a credit to Nintendo's marketing and just the appeal of the platform in general, especially this many years into the generation for the system itself. It's, really building that momentum and it just it doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon and when we look at early 2021 nintendo has had a consistent release schedule yeah some of the games are a little more niche in nature bravely default to you know quality game probably not moving tons of hardware monster hunter rise definitely a big hardware mover but it's definitely more of a hardcore appeal. It doesn't have that casual appeal that we got from Animal Crossing, which sold mountains of hardware. But Nintendo did have Super Mario 3D World with Bowser's Fury, which has done exceptionally well in all regions. And I'm sure moved quite a lot of, you know, hardware as well. Yeah, I mean, you would think so. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is, it seems like Nintendo's got a handle on their on their hardware as well. You know, you know, they were I think at this time last year, it was almost impossible to get a switch. I mean, you could get a switch light, but you couldn't get a just a regular switch, right? Um yes. there, there was shortages. I remember people were trying to, you know, resell um what they had for lots of money. You couldn't get one. Um, but they've since really eliminated that issue. And it's not really been an issue to get a Switch, and it hasn't been for a long time. And I think that's that plays into probably you know the the twenty eight million um, twenty eight point five 
maybe, maybe, you know, high end 29 million that, that we're thinking of. Yeah. I mean, I know some regions have had some limited stock issues. I believe Japan has run into it a couple of times, you know, mostly due to the launch of like a monster hunter. Some North American states have had some limited supply, but Nintendo, it seems as though they did ship, you know, a fairly substantial amount in Q3 in preparation for Q4 or even in Q4 alone. Yeah. And you wonder if they were like stockpiling them, you know, because it was so Mm -hmm. hard to get one in the first half of the year. And you do wonder if that, if they maybe were strategically just holding them back, you know, for the second half, you know what I mean? I believe Nintendo has gone on record where they said they have done that in previous years and even generations, because I believe it's something that like two thirds of their overall yearly sales right come in q3 and q4 because you know it's the holidays that's when you sell a lot so i could definitely see them you know stockpile a bit more especially when you have a slower q1 and q2 though i guess in this case nintendo's q1 for the current for the last fiscal year it did have animal crossing so they may have really just said we have to have as much hardware as we can you know at that time but Nintendo did also come out and say Animal Crossing had exceeded lifetime sales expectations in the first month. Right. So they weren't even expecting a game like Animal Crossing New Horizon to come out of the gate and sell 30 million copies in the first nine months. Yeah. So even they kind of underestimated demand a bit. And when I look at their hardware, and let's say they do come in at, let's say, 28 million. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is really putting them up there with the best performing hardware for a fiscal year of all time. That's ranking them, you know, in the upper echelon. And you really have to look at what Nintendo did in 2020 and early 2021 and say, how did they achieve this? And a large factor of it was they pivoted a bit to a more casual appeal in terms of software lineup. And yes, COVID, quarantine, all played a role. But when you come out with Animal Crossing, Clubhouse Games, another social, local co-op type of game, casual appeal, and then you bring out games like Paper Mario, it's always a controversial topic with Paper Mario. Hardcore fans want it to be something that it's not, but Paper Mario did find success in sales. And then you started to shift towards a little more core-oriented games with Hyrule Warriors, Age of Calamity, and you know monster hunter rise but you also had another casual game with super mario 3d world and bowser's fury and pikmin 3 Mm -hmm. was even in the mix yeah when you bring in that casual appeal that's when you start bringing in new gamers right that's that blue ocean effect that nintendo is really good at utilizing it's where other platformers don't quite have that appeal like sony sony has a casual appeal but it's to a different demographic their casual appeal is 18 to you know like 45 year old males yeah nintendo's casual appeal is Mm five-year-olds to 95 year olds and a game like clubhouse games is a game that i've seen advertised on tv and that my mother has seen that advertised tv and be like what's that game about that's really where nintendo felt like they leveraged 2020 in a really smart way of this is a bad situation but you know these games are scheduled for those release dates regardless of covid but it was kind of a perfect storm for them of we have the exact game you want to play amidst this crisis yeah and i think you know to add to that they had some games in their pocket you know what i mean like we knew that pikmin 3 was a game they they kind of had up their sleeve 3D All Stars was was something rumored that that was around for a while. Um, Clubhouse Games was something that was you know in their pocket. Age of Calamity was certainly something that they were you know that they were looking at as well. So it seems like they covered their bases when COVID hit. That you know, um, even though they were probably scrambling a little bit to figure out how they were going to deliver on 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 all these games and execute on all of them, they were able to to manage it very, very well. And if you go back and look at last year, 
and don't even think about, you know, COVID at all. I mean, it just looks like a really good year for them, like a, a normal year that they had. But I think, you know, if you look a little closer, you can tell that they've really, um, you know, they've plugged some holes, right, to, you know, to make sure that um, they're getting getting the supply out. They, they're selling units and they're selling software. And you got to give them credit for it because, you know, from for a while there, remember there was like a bit of a delay between Paper Mario and the next Direct, and we didn't know what was happening after Paper Mario came out. And all of us were wondering, what's happening with Nintendo? What's the marketing look like? You know, what, when are we going to hear what's next? But, I mean, that aside, they have really delivered on, on you know, on the roadmap for last year. And, look, it's... It's something that I think, you know, they're going to come away from this with having, you know, one of their best years ever. And I think, you know, that will definitely show on the report when, when we see it next week. Yeah, this is definitely going down as one of their, this is a banner year for Nintendo. Yeah. It may not have been a banner year when you look at software releases in right. terms of, you know, overall appeal. They did have some large gaps. If you weren't interested in games like Animal Crossing, you had to wait until Pikmin 3. If Pikmin 3 wasn't your cup of tea, maybe Super Mario 3D All-Stars was it. In terms of like their software variety, they had plenty. It just wasn't that, it wasn't core oriented where I think a lot of gamers were hoping for like, you know, that big adventure game. Yeah. And we got it towards, you know, the second half of the year with Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, which, you know, it's a Muso game. So that means its appeal is inherently limited. But then you had Monster Hunter Rise close out the fiscal year, a little more popular, still, still niche in nature to a certain degree. But I think that casual focus really benefited them in terms of hardware sales. And that's why it is a banner year for them. And, you know, if you can sell 27, 28, 29 million units in a single year, you did something right. and. Nintendo certainly did something right because that's exactly what they're going to report in just over a week. And that brings me to the point of what do you anticipate that Nintendo will forecast for the current fiscal year? So April 1st of 2021 yep. to the end of March 2022. Oh, it's a tough question. Tough question. I mean, you would think, you would think that numbers would be slowing a little bit this year because number one, there's talk about new hardware. So maybe, you know, some people are, mm -hmm. are holding out for that, but then, you know, that's what you and I have heard. That's what the Twitterverse is saying. That's what, that's what Bloomberg saying. That's what, you know, um, some media outlets are saying the, the average person on the street, the, the families, the, the mom and pops with the kids that want the switch, do they know about a new switch? And I think that's where it gets interesting because you do wonder, you know, how wide stream the the message that the the most likely will be new hardware announced this year. You know how far and wide that that message has gone. But I do think even even without that, I think that it, it will slow up a little this year. I don't know how many. I mean, I'm I'm not great at, at predictions when it comes to numbers like this, but <laughs> I would say that it will slow up a little. Um, you know, it's not going to be the same trajectory as last year. I, I do think it will dip a little bit this year. So you think? Let's say the end of year at, we'll say twenty eight. Yep. Do you think Nintendo could potentially finish the current fiscal year? strong let's say 22 yeah i was gonna you say you see a dip, something like that y yeah i think so i mean i i could see 22 um but again i mean you know it, it, that really does depend on the the switch pro stuff you know if, mm -hmm. if that's and that's the part that i i just don't know you know but how many right. people know about a switch pro you know uh, we know about right. it because we we read about it in Bloomberg articles and stuff. But <laughs> the average person, you know, your 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 nephew, your um, your you know your your you know your auntie or whatever, you know, with with kids, do, do they know about a new switch right. that's coming? And I think that's that's really the question that we got to ask. Yeah, when I look at what Nintendo could potentially forecast for the current fiscal year, the Pro is definitely a factor. 
I think the biggest variable for me is just the uncertainty of the production line. Yeah. Nintendo has come out and said, right now we have enough supply for the next couple of months. But if things don't improve, we're really not sure how this is going to you know, impact our supply chain and how much hardware we're going to have available. So if I'm Nintendo, I'm going to pull very, you know, a similar stunt as what I did for last fiscal year of maybe come in at 19 million units. I want to come in conservative and safe, something I am confident I'm going to achieve. And if the supply line becomes, you know, a little more free mm-hmm. and I can increase production, I'll revise that once I have a better grasp of what's actually coming, you know, down the line this year. And Nintendo also has an idea in terms of software coming in the fiscal year. Right now, Nintendo hasn't dated all that much. We are operating under the idea that the Pokemon remakes will be their holiday game, where right now I'm I'm operating under the idea that Breath of the Wild 2 is a March release, so end of the fiscal year. Right. So that will be weighed into my hardware guidance. Now if, there is a there is always the possibility Breath of the Wild two doesn't even make this fiscal year. Right. Uh, real quick, if there is a new Switch revision, does that fall mm-hmm. into the Switch as far as these numbers? It, yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. It, Nintendo would put that into it. I don't think they would necessarily give guidance with the Pro in mind right now. Right. Because they're probably still weighing specific timing to launch the hardware. So like right now, let's say internal discussions are, we hope to get it out for this holiday. Well, we can revise our, you know, our hardware forecast after our Q2 report, once we're confident that we are hitting that and we'll increase it by however many units we're gonna launch with the Pro. So Mm -hmm. right now, when they give the, you know, their guidance in the first week of May, I don't think it would be included just for safety protocol, because the last thing you want to do as a company like Nintendo is come out with a number, let's say 20 million. Right. And then have to revise it down. <laughs> investors, yeah. you know, investors get shook. Your stock price goes down. Yes. You're better off lowballing and then you, you know, you get higher. Right. And that makes stockholders happy. Your share go up. And I think Nintendo has to play it safe because there is that uncertainty. They don't know how those supply chains are going to go. And if I'm Nintendo, I want to look at how well the current Switch and Switch Lite are performing. If they're still selling out in regions and we're seeing strong demand, they might say, we don't have to rush the revision out this holiday with limited supply. Let's wait a couple of months, introduce it towards the end of the fiscal year, have a little more ample supply if possible, and end the fiscal year strong. They have to weigh all these options. And at the same time, they have to weigh software availability that could be leveraging the pro's unique selling features like 4K functionality or DLSS. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all those have to be weighed too. So when Nintendo probably looks at the pros and cons of introducing the Switch Pro this fiscal year, all of that's being factored in. And, you know, you have to talk to your developer, your development partners and say, hey, is that software that you were designing with the pro in mind going to be ready? And we don't know the range of impacts COVID has had or still is having on those projects. So I'm not anticipating Nintendo to make any mention of new hardware next week. I do think we will hear about it this fiscal year. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think they'll mention it next week. I, I, that yeah, that that would I think that would be very confusing to investors if if that's what they were you know if that's what was mentioned yes. at that time. Yeah, you don't you want to say our hardware is doing very strong. We have great expectations for the coming fiscal year, and we have great momentum. We have new ideas planned. Yeah, to keep interest high. You know, that general PR speak that we see so often from Nintendo, I'd expect a lot of that, just nothing directly associated to Pro, which is obviously going to lead to rumors where people are going to say, oh, look, Nintendo didn't mention the Switch Pro. It must not be happening. No, 
this is standard business procedure. Mm -hmm. You don't show all your cards before you are ready to, you know, do the flip. Nintendo has a long game ahead of them. So what about the software side? So Mm -hmm. last year, Animal Crossing was the big anchor game, right? That just, you know, it was there and it sold so many units. And then there was a lot of other games that came out that, that sold really well around it. This yes. year, how do you feel about software? Because we've got Pokemon Snap coming out here on on Friday. We've got um, the uh, the Zelda um, HD coming out later this year. There's a few yes. things that have already been you know dated and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. What do you think the software sales side is going to be like? I mean, obviously Mario Kart Deluxe is going to continue to sell really well. Smash Brothers will, Animal Crossing will. The um, uh, Breath of the Wild continues to to sell well. We've got Pokemon games coming out uh, as well this year. So how do you feel about the software side? Do you think that it could actually be a better year in terms of overall sales than last year? I mean, for the prior fiscal year, Nintendo started with a forecast of 140 million units. They revised that to 170 million, and then they increased it to 205 million units of software yeah. so 205 million pieces of software in a fiscal year is a high number um based on what we know for the current fiscal year which is very little we know skyward sword hd as you mentioned pokemon yeah. snap mario golf famicom detective yep um but there the, will be a yeah. zelda hd collection you know announced yes. right Yes. E3 will have a E3. Nintendo will have a, a presence at E3. And it probably will be um, you know, I think something fairly significant from them yeah. that we'll see. Yes. Um, yeah, like like the Zelda anniver- anniversary collection. Um it's tough to really give a hard figure as to what Nintendo could forecast and really expect this fiscal year just based on that limited knowledge. If we do operate under the idea of, let's say, everything's on track, we get the Zelda dual anniversary collection with Twilight Princess and Wind Waker HD, we have Skyward Sword, we have the Pokemon remakes this holiday, we have Mario Golf, Pokemon Snap sells exceedingly well. Um, Metroid Prime and Trilogy the sells a million. Yeah, Metroid Prime Trilogy comes out before the end of the fiscal year. Breath of the Wild 2 comes out before the end of the fiscal year. A 2D Metroid comes out this fiscal year. And we're probably getting into some dream territory now <laughs> to have all of this happen. Something would get delayed out. Um, they could potentially... 205 million units is a lot of software. It is, isn't it? I, I think for that figure to be obtained... You, you do wonder if, it, if there won't be that same impact when Animal Crossing came out where everyone just bought it like right. you know, almost immediately and continued to buy the game because you're right, it was it was a perfect storm for them as much as I hate to say it, but COVID really, really was yeah. very beneficial for that game. Yeah, it just it accelerated the sales of that game. I don't know if you're going to have a game of that impact released this fiscal year and it hurts me to say that like you could have let's say a new kirby game comes out that is a consistent quality two to four million unit seller what if the open world pokemon game makes it that could be pretty big if that game makes it by the end of the fiscal year then i'm going to remove breath of the wild 2 from my calculations yeah so, like, I don't see both of them happening this fiscal year. So let's substitute Breath of the Wild 2 for the Pokemon. Yeah. And I think that Pokemon could open incredibly strong. Let's If they position it in March, first month sales, I'd say definitely 10 million plus. Mm-hmm. It still doesn't have that. It's still not a 30 million unit seller yeah. for the fiscal year to match Animal Crossing. And the thing with Animal Crossing is we're getting an update this week it's not a substantial update how many more sales does animal crossing have in front of it it's already north 
of 31 million sales as of the end of December. So what is the ceiling for Animal Crossing New Horizon, even with new content updates? 35? Ooh. Will it push the 40 million? Could be 40, honestly. So, okay, let's say 40. Yeah. 9 million for, this current, for the coming fiscal year. Not bad. That's a great fiscal year. Many companies would love to have a game sell 9 million copies in a fiscal year. Um, Mario Kart 8. If we operate under the idea that there's not a Mario Kart 9 or any new Mario Kart or Nintendo Kart type of game this fiscal year, Mario Kart 8 right now is just shy of 33 and a half million units. Mm -hmm. It'll probably continue to be bundled. There's no reason that game couldn't potentially hit 40 million by the end of the current fiscal year. So it's just, you know, another 6 million sales. Yeah. Smash Brothers will continue to sell. It's just shy of 23 million. So they could easily get to 26, maybe 27 million, depending on the last two DLC characters. Um, it's really hard to predict if Nintendo could get to 205 or higher software sales this year. I think you would need a Breath of the Wild 2 caliber game to get there. You need that anchor game again, don't you? You need that, that just that massive game. And I'm just not, I'm not confident enough to say that we will definitely get Breath of the Wild 2 right. this fiscal year. I think we will get new information about it. We will see a new trailer. They will drop a release date, but not necessarily this fiscal year. I could see it. I could it definitely first, I can't even say definitely. I can see it being positioned first half of 2022. It's just a question of will it be after March? Mm -hmm. And with the way Pokemon Legacy is confirmed as far as, you know, we have from official, you know, documentation and press, they have it slated spring of 2022. So they have reason to believe that they will have that game out at least ahead of June of 2022. So, yeah, it's tough. I They will have a strong soft. They will also have a strong year with software. I think they come in. I think they split the difference. I think instead of coming in as high as 205, you split the difference with 170 and you come in like 180. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's a, that's a pretty fair thing to say. Um, you don't have that Animal Crossing game, but you will still have a pretty strong lineup. And on all accounts, it sounds like Nintendo will have, they have more things to show us, um, which, you know, yes. will obviously impact that, that number as well. But it will be interesting to see what number they start out with. I think you're right. They'll, they'll start out, you know, low balling, as you said, or very conservative and, and maybe mm-hmm. just start revising it over time. I mean, one thing that will be big this fiscal year for Nintendo is going to be the anniversary marketing ploy, I'll call it. We have Zelda's 35th. We also have Metroid's anniversary, Donkey Kong's anniversary as well. So Zelda's 35th is obviously the biggest of those three getting attention. We already have Skyward Sword. It should sell... Well, it wasn't a huge seller on the Wii because it came out so late in that console's generation. So I think it may have a, I'll say, renewed interest, a lot of first timers. And yeah. depending on the improvements Nintendo has made to the game, I think that will impact the sales. I'm not sure how many, I'm not sure how high of a percentage of people are going to revisit it. It's a game I beat on the Wii. I enjoyed my time with it. It is the one Zelda game I have never gone back to. I don't necessarily think they're looking, they're targeting the people that have already played. I think they're really going after the people that haven't played it. You know what I mean? I think that's mm-hmm. what they're going for. Um, and I think, you know, with that type of marketing, it will really sell well, you know? Yeah, especially with, you know, the removal or the addition of standard controls and not the reliance on motion controls. That will definitely appeal to new people. And it might get some curious double dippers who played it on the Wii, hated the motion controls and say, you know, I want to experience experience it in a traditional way. 
So they may come back to the game. I mean, I could see the game selling 12 million. Oh, maybe easily. 15, yeah. maybe I would 15. Say, I would say 10 to 15, 15 being the high end. 10's no. uh, an absolute certainty. 12, 12, 12 and a half is probably, you know, the, 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 the average or what I think will happen, but it could go mm-hmm. as high as 15, honestly. Now, the Zelda anniversary, we'll call it the anniversary collection with Wind Waker and Twilight Princess HD. As long as it is a dual pack priced at $60, that should perform equally as well. Yes, I think so too. I mean, this is probably a pack that they're not going to have a lot of new content. It's going to be the Wii U versions. It's just going to be HD Wind Waker, HD Twilight Princess, single pack. Here you go. Probably not a high effort affair. Yep. It's just going to be two games in a single pack, mm-hmm. which, you know, it's probably enough for some people just to have Wind Waker portable. Um, I think that's. We might see them go a little further with the 35th anniversary, and they maybe we see Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask in some way, whether it's uh, as you know HD N64 games on the eShop, similar to what we saw at Mario 64. I don't know if you bring them in a retail pack, though. Yeah, I, I do. I do agree. I think we'll definitely see those games in some form. And it's probably going to be via the eShop. Whether it's a digital thing does remain to be seen. Most likely, knowing Nintendo, they'll make it digital. Uh, sorry, they'll make it physical in like PAL regions, and we won't get it here in North America. You know, so <laughs> the, the thing that they normally do, right? Um, but I do think we will definitely get those games in some capacity, and I think they'll they'll sell well. You know, um, mm-hmm. I think they'll do really extremely well, actually. Now for Metroid. I have fair confidence that we will see a 2D Metroid release this year, barring any last minute delays, which, you know, it can happen. Game development's delayed all the time, but I do believe we will see the 2D Metroid release in calendar 2020. And it's the prime time, pun intended, for (laughs) Metroid Prime Trilogy to release with the anniversary. And we know Nintendo's love or recent love with limited time releases and yes. metroid prime trilogy was a limited time release when it came out on the wii yes so let's do it again on the switch <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> i think we'll look we're definitely going to see something from metroid this year and mm-hmm. and i think i've said this uh previously will we get both of those things we would love it um we'll, we'll get at least one of them we'll either get the 2d or the prime trilogy we may get both. We may get both, and that would be awesome for the fans, but we'll definitely get one of those two, I think. I'm expecting both. It's just a question of the timing as to when you bring them to market. Yeah. You don't want them too close to each other, even though they are vastly different experiences. I think back to when Metroid Prime came out, Nintendo launched Metroid Fusion on the exact same day for the Game Boy Advance. Maybe we see something similar happen here. You bring Metroid Prime Trilogy to the Switch and you have a new 2D Metroid launch same day. So it's E3, be- it's E3 2021. Nintendo's about to <laughs> um to you know present. Do you if you're on Nintendo, do you present the 2D game or do you present the tr- the Prime Trilogy? I present the 2D game. I would probably I think, present the Prime Trilogy, but I want to hear your your your, your thoughts about it, your reasoning behind that. I think the 2D Metroid would generate a little more excitement because it's new. We mm-hmm. haven't had a new Metroid game in well over a decade. We did have Samus Returns remake on the 3DS in 2017, it was. Yep. And quality game. I think once you introduce a brand new 2D Metroid that's going to excite the fan base. Metroid Prime Trilogy is exciting. It's something that fans have been waiting for, especially to have on the Switch. Portable Metroid Prime 1, that's something we dreamed of when we played it on the GameCube. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to become reality. It's exciting in its own merit, but I think having a brand new Metroid no one's ever played before would generate greater hype and buzz 
for that community and just for you know Nintendo fans in general. But that's not to downplay the significance of Metroid Prime Trilogy. Yeah, I mean, you might be right. I mean, the way that I see this going down is, and look, I, I'm I'm fanboying here. Like this is me <laughs> fanboying, but I, 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 you know, I'm I'm like envisaging a Metroid Prime Four trailer, right? But they don't, you know, they show us the, the game or they show us more of the game, but it's not coming, you know, and they'll put like 2022 on there or something, right? Um, because it's not coming out this year. We know that. But then they kind of pivot to Prime Trilogy, you know, and that's um, available in September, for example. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like that would be a pretty hype announcement if they if they showed us something like that. You know, the, you, you you hook them, hook the hook the people, hook the fans with the Prime Four stuff, and then you know, I don't want to say bait and switch, but then you know, show them the the, the Prime Trilogy um, <laughs> stuff, and then you know, let them know when it's coming out later this year. I think that would be pretty hype. See, like, we'll probably touch on this topic in greater detail once E3 nears. Yeah. But like when I think of E3, I know everyone's thought is there wasn't an E3 last year. So Nintendo is going to come to E3 this year. Big. Can Nintendo really waltz into E3? Say, here's Wind Waker HD, Twilight Princess HD, a Breath of the Wild 2 trailer. Yeah. Um, Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask coming to Nintendo Switch Online. Here's a new 2D Metroid game, Metroid Prime Trilogy, <laughs> Metroid Prime Trilogy 4 trailer. <laughs> I, I know what you're saying. Like, I think I think we need to temper expectations like we normally do when, when these types of things happen. You're absolutely right. Um, look, Nintendo should have a good E3 showing this year. It'll be solid. Will it be the best one yeah. they've had in history? Absolutely not. I don't think so, but I think there will be some big announcements and some surprises. And I think Metroid, whether it's 2D mm -hmm. or if it's the Prime Trilogy, would be a surprise because we're at yes. the point now where we're like, is this thing even happening anymore? Do we even know? You know, um, <laughs> based on, you know, the F-Zero discussions that happened last week about how Nintendo doesn't seem interested in revising F-Zero, <laughs> Is Metroid really something that is is that relevant anymore as well? So I think there'll be some surprises. And, and you're right. I, I'd love to revisit this topic when it comes closer to E3 time. Yeah, when it comes closer to E3, it's definitely a topic we'll you know, revisit. And the thing with Nintendo is they don't need to unload all of that E3. They yeah. can wait, you know, September or another summer direct, anything in between. And I mean, that's the thing when we're looking at potential for their software guidance if we get a number out next week where it's let's say it's upwards of 200 million mm -hmm. we'd have to revisit this topic and say if nintendo's forecasting 200 million units and we look at their release schedule on the bottom of their investors briefing and there's a lot of tbd associated to games like breath of the wild 2 sequel yeah. metroid prime 4 you know bayonetta 3 all those types of games you really have to wonder what is nintendo prepping right for this fiscal year that they're that confident that they could move 200 million pieces of software like yes the switch hardware will be nearing you know right now it's at 79 million Probably by the end of March, we're probably looking at a number closer to 82 to 83 million. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, to sell 200 million pieces of software, we're really only saying every single Switch owner needs to buy two and a half games. Right. But obviously, not all 79 million Switches out there right now remain active. Some have been sold. The users yep. are no longer interacting with it. So, you know, it's not that simple. Like, yes, the hardware numbers are increasing but you still have to sell substantial software to hit a 200 million figure. Um, we have Donkey Kong. It is, it's, it is Donkey Kong's 40th anniversary. Nintendo hasn't mentioned anything about Donkey Kong, but there is an aura in the air. Mm -hmm. This is information I have heard now for several months that a new Donkey Kong game is in development. And a lot of the information I have seen has been, it's been challenging to verify. Some of the information that I do get verified is 
kind of canceled out by other information or the information is constantly evolving and changing. One constant is it seems as though we could at least hear of a new Donkey Kong for this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. That would be a pretty hot announcement. Yes. If we get a new Donkey Kong this year, that could be, depending on the genre type, it could be a decent seller for Nintendo. If they go the 3D route similar to Donkey Kong 64, yep. it could you know, it could sell well, especially if they do an open world type of design similar to what we saw with Bowser's Fury. That could excite people. If they stick to the Donkey Kong Country design of a 2D Donkey Kong, Tropical Freeze is one of, if not the best 2D platformers ever made. But for whatever reason, Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze just cannot obtain big sales. Yeah. So if you're Nintendo, do you want to push the envelope beyond and try to get that 8, 10 million unit selling Donkey Kong by going 3D? Or do you go with that safe 3 to 4 million 2D Donkey Kong? I'm not sure. I would love to see Donkey Kong be announced this year. I think we're overdue for a brand new Donkey Kong. So, I mean, that's something that we'll revisit when we talk about E3 projections, you know, in about a month. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one as well because, look, the Bowser's Fury um, engine, let's call it, I feel like that that was, I don't want to say experimental, but it was a taste of potentially some things that Nintendo could, you know, could develop and, and you know, make fully fledged games out of because I, I really enjoyed what they did with that. And mm-hmm. to your point, if they will say remaster or remake Donkey Kong 64 and use the Bowser's Fury engine for it, I think that would be really, really good. I mean, I think that would be great actually if they, went down that path but you're right i mean that also seems like a a time commitment um it seems like a lot of development or you know do they just like you said play it safe a little bit and then go the 2d donkey kong route which you know it's going to be fantastic as well but you're right it may not sell the same amount of numbers um just based on on what it is and based on previous sales of those games as well. So, yeah, very interesting. Um, same thing with Metroid. I mean, I think we'll definitely see something Donkey Kong related. And, you know, if you've heard some rumblings as well, I mean, I think, you know, this is definitely a where there's smoke, there's fire type thing. So I'm interested to see what they have for us come E3 time. Yeah. Like, as I said, we'll revisit this, you know, this topic a bit more with E3. There's a lot of, it's a lot of, predictions i have for nintendo's e3 that we won't get into on this topic only because it involves you know like third parties and such and this is strictly you know for nintendo one thing i do want to touch on before we conclude and i'll say it this will be the last bit of forecasting do you think bayonetta 3 releases this fiscal year no really i do not do not remember this game was announced in december of 2017 yep we have not heard of it since we have not seen it since based on the last information we got about bayonetta from platinum which was we'll let you know when it's ready type of thing (laughs) i don't really hold much hope that we'll see it this fiscal i hope and this is definitely a i hope i'm wrong scenario i I don't know man i i just the the and look maybe maybe the message was lost in translation you know because i mean that happens sometimes you know when you um but it just Mm -hmm. to me it just felt like leave us alone we'll we'll show it when we're ready to show it and i didn't you know that's that's a different message than stay tuned because we'll have more to show we'll we'll have something to to show later on this year you know what i mean like yeah the the way that that was kind of communicated just didn't really feel good to me and again want to be very clear could have been lost in translation it could have been you know google translate or something like that 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 happened Mm -hmm. 
But I just don't get a good feeling about this game at all, unfortunately. I think I think we will hear of it this fiscal year. I think we'll get like a new trailer. Maybe the possibility of a release, but if it does, it would be, you know, towards the back half of this fiscal year. But I would say I'm more confident that we do get an update on it this fiscal year and a new trailer. And actually one more company I want to include monolith soft Mm -hmm. their last game was last year with xenoblade chronicles definitive edition prior to that i can't believe it's been a year since that game came out i I feel like we were talking about that maybe five nate the hates ago (laughs) yeah it feels like (laughs) yeah (laughs) but we had xenoblade chronicles 2 come out in 2017 we then had torna come out yep so Based on their historical release pattern, we're actually due for Monolith Soft to have a new product this fiscal year. And I have said elsewhere that I am fairly confident that at minimum, we will have an announcement of a brand new Monolith Soft game this fiscal year. Do you think we will? Yes, I think we will. And I think it may be something that will be targeting new hardware okay but I, I do think we'll we'll get an announcement this fiscal absolutely yeah i i don't think it would necessarily be at e3 but maybe you know might change my mind before we record our e3 discussion but i do think we will have an announcement about a new monolith soft game this fiscal year potentially even release this fiscal year if it is targeting the new hardware that's where it becomes that slippery slope mm-hmm. If the hardware itself, let's say, slides out of the fiscal year, I think the game would too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're in April. This is something that we may not see for another few months. It may not release for another 10 months. So it's really tough to gauge right now. But, I mean, overall, I am I'm excited for what Nintendo's coming year potentially has. Because as we mentioned, they have the 35th anniversary of Zelda, Donkey Kong, Metroid, there's a lot of software that they have announced that still remains missing, like Bayonetta 3, Breath of the Wild 2. And there's that prospect of always new hardware and new software, be it Pokemon games or just the return of franchises like Kirby and never mind third party stuff, which you know we'll get into in another topic right. Right on another day. And there could, be, just- there could be some new IP as well. I mean, you know, Furukawa did yes. did hint that, you know, they're they're gonna focus more on on new IP and not necessarily mm-hmm. going back. So there could be some some new announcements that that really surprise, you know, people and and some one of the one or more of these could be really, really popular amongst people. Yeah, nobody, when Ring Fit Adventure was introduced, I don't think many people had anticipated it would be a 5 million plus seller. And now it's one of Nintendo's bigger sales in terms of new IPs. Not everything turns out like a Labo and just becomes a pile of cardboard boxes in the corner of every room. (laughs) Some do find success. And I mean, right now, I... I mean, I'm excited for what Nintendo could be bringing out the current fiscal year. I don't know if it will be a banner year as their 2020 year was, but I think it's going to be a year that Nintendo looks back on. And as fans, it's something to be excited for. Yes, delays may happen. But right now, I think Nintendo is going to operate in a very strong and confident manner. And we should have a wide variety of unique software from new IPs and established IPs to play in the coming months. Yeah, I agree with that. Now we can shift over to some of the Streamlabs questions that have accumulated over the last 17 or so days (laughs) because we took a nice little vacation. (laughs) We had a $5 donation from Furud Bat, no question. We then had a $1 donation from Jackie G, who writes, does the next Mega Man game run on the RE engine? It could. Have they announced a new Mega Man game? They haven't, but I mean, if they did, it could easily run on the RE engine. I mean, we've seen, you know, the Ghouls and Ghosts Resurrection, Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection, I should say. Um, 
yeah, I mean, I, I could I could definitely see that happening. Yeah, the engine has proved quite versatile, and Ghost and Goblins Resurrection was a fantastic use of the engine, and it's coming to Steam, Xbox, and PlayStation on June first. So if you haven't picked it up already on Switch, you should definitely give it a look on June first. Then had a dollar donation from Liam Warner, who writes prediction. I think Nintendo will do the E3 Switch app, like you said, but I think it will have demos. They can always release something bare bones that won't have much to be data mined. However, because it's Nintendo, a full year long Nintendo Switch online subscription will be needed. They could do a bare bones demo. They would have to add the citation at the beginning saying this isn't representative of final product and all that and the problem with e3 demos i've encountered this numerous times at various media events is they crash yep they basically serve the break so i that's my hesitation of nintendo releasing any type of demo for like you know an e3 digital event is that they can break and they don't want that to become the narrative um but certain games, I could see maybe limited demos for the week if you have a Nintendo Switch Online subscription, but I wouldn't anticipate anything too major in terms of demo distribution from Nintendo. They are a very secret company, and they don't want people data mining a demo. And even if they could do their best to limit the information that is accessible in the files, there's always something that they forget. And... It's really not something Nintendo wants to have a headache over. I agree with that. I, I can't see it happening for that reason. I mean, they could they could offer some type of cloud, you know, a, approach. <laughs> I mean, there are some games that run through cloud services. They could maybe do that. But even that, I don't think they're going to do. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, like you said, Nate, E3 demos break. I mean, they're very, very controlled. They're very <laughs> curated. What you don't see is the Nintendo um, employee resetting the switch every time, you know, um, yes. you know, the next person has to play the game. There's a lot that goes on um, with that stuff. So I don't see that happening, unfortunately. Yeah. Like some people think it's a joke when we say that before a game launches, Every developer, programmer, everyone who's on the staff, and I'm sure you can attest to this, is that the game is literally being held together with band-aids and splints. They, yes. You're waiting for it to break. Yes, I can attest to it, and that's absolutely <laughs> correct. We then had a $1 donation from Alan, who writes, what exactly is a game engine? I hear about the Frostbite engine, but what exactly are you referring to? Can different genres of games run the same engine? Yeah, genre genre really doesn't matter when it comes to a game engine. A game engine is it's just it's the tool you use to build the game. Yeah. So you, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Genre type doesn't matter. If I want to take Frostbite Engine, which you typically see, you know, it's in Madden, mm -hmm. FIFA, Battlefield. The RE engine, you know, seen with the Resident Evil games, Ghosts and Goblins, Resurrection, the Capcom Arcade Stadium also uses our RE engine. It's just a tool set. Yep. Then had a $20 donation from Calvin Atkinson, who writes, I am convinced the Switch will become the console where Nintendo will finally release Mother 3 in the West. But if Nintendo are gracious enough to do that, do you think... It would be a Game Boy Advance Nintendo Switch Online collection or what I'm dreading, limited release like Fire Emblem. Um, Neither, because yeah. Nintendo will never release Mother 3 in the West. I agree. They will never <laughs> release that game. If we ever see Mother 3, it will be a full-on remake of the game, so it would essentially be a brand-new release. There's just certain aspects of the game I don't think Nintendo wants to deal with with a Western release due to various characters and even some dialogue and depiction of characters i agree and then we'll get into that hashtag release the original mother three cut or something you know yep it's not it's 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 not going to happen yeah it's just it's not worth the headache for them then had a ten dollar donation from dharma ma Right. Hello, Nate and MVG. I just want to say that Paper Mario Origami King is amazing and people 
We need to stop living in the past. Nintendo are giving us new and fresh mechanics, not the same RPG mechanics. We should acknowledge diversity. Great show. You're right. We should acknowledge this diversity in game design and Paper Mario, Origami King, from everything I have heard, the story, the writing, and the characters are top notch. Some just found the battle system to be a little boring, but Paper Mario has grown to a new audience with the direction Nintendo is taking it. And I understand people want to go back to what Thousand Year Door or Paper Mario 64 brought to the series, but there have been more entries with this new approach than there were with the old approach. And I think it is time for people to just accept that Nintendo has a clear vision of where they want to take Paper Mario. And this is the vision that they see for it. They do continue to innovate the franchise in different ways. So maybe the battle system will continue to evolve and be a little more engaging with the next Paper Mario than what we saw in Origami King. But I do think people have to stop living in the past. And if the new entries don't appeal to you, that's okay, because there's millions of people who are enjoying them. Then had a $5 donation from Thanos was right. Are we officially done with the mini console boom period, or will we possibly see something such as a mini N64 from Nintendo in the near future, or fingers crossed, a Sega Dreamcast mini? Um... So I've made a video talking about why I don't think the N64 Mini will come out. And it really comes down to technical reasons and price. And also it comes down to the fact that they've lost Rare, which is responsible for some of the very best N64 games. And if you don't have that available to you, then it really does kind of cripple the... I guess the experience. So I suggest you take a look at that video that I did. It's on my channel. Um, I did it maybe, well, it's been a while. It's been like 18 months, maybe almost two years, but I do still stand by the fact that I don't think there'll be an N64 mini, at least not for a while. A Dreamcast mini seems more likely to me, but one thing I will say is I do feel like we are past that mini craze right now. This time last year, I felt like there was just every console manufacturer from, you know, days past was was coming up with their own mini system. You know, Sega did it. Um, We had the Turbo Graphics, obviously. Nintendo had theirs, the PlayStation and everything like that. It feels like we're past that now. They're not really, you know, it doesn't seem like it's really happening anymore. So I don't really know... um, if we will see another mini system, maybe for a while. Um, but if if you ask me which one is more likely, I would say the Dreamcast Mini is probably more likely than the N64. Yeah, I would agree with that. As you mentioned with the N64, there's a lot of obstacles there. And we know Nintendo does have at least a working emulator, thanks to Mario 64 yep. in the 3D All-Stars collection. But the controllers, as you mentioned, and even the software catalog to really make a compelling N64 mini would present some challenges. A lot of iconic N64 games were made by Rare and those IPs are now owned by Microsoft. So you would have to get cooperation with Microsoft to release titles like Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, Perfect Dark, Conker's Bad Fur Day, GoldenEye, which would just be a disaster to try to get you know those licensing rights to. Killer Instinct Gold. Well, who knows? Maybe Nintendo will um, let uh, Microsoft <laughs> put Game Pass on the Switch as a fair trade for that. What do you think? I think that's a fair trade. <laughs> it's very fair. <laughs> Nintendo might benefit a little more out of it, but <laughs> I'd, I'd welcome that. But a Dreamcast Mini? Oh, man. If you could get Power Stone. Yeah, that would be, that would be pretty good. Crazy Taxi and um, Skies yes. of Arcadia. I mean, that would be a pretty hype, hype system. Get the light gun games on there like dynamite cop oh yeah oh man that'd be that's a system that's a game of the year contending hardware right there yep sega if you're listening make it happen (laughs) then had a five dollar donation from anthony belvedere writes you answer my question on twitter peace that i did then had a five dollar donation from s lopez 05 who writes mr hate and mr gamer 
Sony reminds me of Apple, where they don't care if iOS or phone leader or phone lead or iPhone lead market share or sales in units. Higher prices, less units sold result in giant profits. It's about stock price, shareholders, and bonuses. See Bobby Kotick. I don't know if there was a question there, but I mean, Sony is the market leader and they set the price, you know, in, in, in this stuff. It's really up to Microsoft to disrupt what they're doing. And, you know, mm-hmm. they're slowly starting to do that with Game Pass. But yeah, I mean, Sony does what Sony does and they always have at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, Sony will chase profits. And I mean, if they can sell games at $70 and if they sell at a similar rate as what they were selling at $60, they're going to do that. I mean, iPhones and Apple, they do charge you a premium and they sell very well. I mean, I'm an Android user myself. Um, but I mean, un- business is business yep. and they do answer to their stockholders. And at the end of the day, that's really who they're responsible for. And that's who they aim to please. They want to have as high of profits as possible. And that's just the nature of corporate business. Then had a $5 donation from Sherbert picks writes. Hi, Nate and MVG from New Zealand, loving the show and appreciate the deep dives and managing realistic expectations you guys give. My question is for MVG. Congrats on finishing Shantae. What were the highs and lows of developing the return of this iconic game? I think the highs for me was probably getting Matt Boson's approval and his blessing that we'd done a good job on the game. You know, obviously you want the creator of the game to give the thumbs up. And I think when he did, when he saw the game for the first time and he was very happy and very excited about it. Um, That was a good moment for me. Um, The lows wasn't really too many lows, but I I would say that maybe, um, you know, the development time, um, I mean, this, this started back in 2019. So it took maybe a little longer to to come out than, than what I initially anticipated. And look, that's, that's game development. You know, whatever you predict is going to happen or whatever you estimate on a piece of paper, um, is usually grossly inaccurate. You usually double it and then double it again, and that's probably what what is likely going to happen. But even that really wasn't a big deal. I, I just felt like, you know, I wanted to ship this game earlier, and I was, um, you know, hopeful that we could have. But at the end of the day, look, that what wasn't really a big negative for me. It was just it's just game development. But um, no, very happy with the release and appreciate the question. Yep, and it is a quality release. I was given a review code by way forward, so I'm playing it, and yeah, I have enjoyed the game me. thoroughly. You had the game before me. That's hilarious. I did have the game before you. <laughs> that, that's 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 direct feed games for you right there. Gets the game right. where everyone else does. And I, I have enjoyed the game a great deal, and it's not because MVG is a co-host here. If the game was bad, I would have said MVG, this game isn't good. Yeah, I think the game turned out really well. Um, I mean, look, it, it yeah. is a it's a Game Boy Color game from 2002, and there is some things about games from that era that mm-hmm. don't necessarily translate very well to 2021. But you know, we tried to make it as friendly as possible um, in this modern era, and I think you know, for the most part, we we managed to uh, to get there. Yeah, I mean, visually, it's crisp. It runs well. It's, I mean. It's an HD Game Boy Color game, mm-hmm. but it looks it's quite sharp, and visually pleasing for a game from that era just to be HD to modern times. It's definitely a very delightful game. I thoroughly enjoyed my time with it. Then had a five dollar and ninety five cent donation from Riva. It writes the Wii U was a stationary three DS attempt, but no one seems to recognize it. And if there had been a native support for three DS cards to simply play on the big TV. The Wii U most likely could have been a success, at least in half the world. Do you agree? Um, I don't know if I saw the Wii U as a stationary 3DS. It did seem as though it was a deconstruct deconstructed attempt at the DS and maybe even a 
beta of what the Switch was to become. I don't know if necessarily having native DS support or 3DS support would have assisted the Wii U because where the Wii U fell short was simply in, it was the marketing. The marketing was a failure pretty much from day one when Nintendo introduced it at E3 and there was no clear sign as to what the system actually was. And if you go back to the E3 unveiling of the Wii U, all they basically headlined was the gamepad. Yep. And that's basically what stuck with it. People continually thought it was an accessory to the Wii and Nintendo's marketing they just failed to really illustrate what made the system unique or why you needed the gamepad. And even when you played games like Zombie U, it wasn't enough for people to say like, wow, this is really a revolutionary experience. When you played a game like Affordable Space Adventures, that really demonstrated the gamepad well. But those types of releases were so few and far between that the Wii U really was just, I think it was a product that came out five years too late yeah i think it was introduced earlier it may have found success it just came out after kind of that tablet boom and it was just a confusing piece of hardware yep i I totally agree with everything you said then had a five dollar donation from symphonic balance writes does the addition of bluetooth functionality to the nintendo switch mean that in theory Nintendo could release a new pro controller model with a headphone jack. Love listening to the podcast. Keep it up, gentlemen. In theory, yes, they could. Yes, in theory, that is a potential product and one I would welcome. Absolutely. I would love that. (laughs) Then had a dollar donation from Skittittles, who writes, Hi, with the Series X, S, and PlayStation 5, both capable of playing last-gen games, Do you think we'll see games that don't need to take advantage of the new systems, especially indies, be released for the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 for the duration of this new generation? Not for the duration, but um, let's say for the foreseeable future. Like, I think probably end of next year will be kind of the cutoff. I mean, we'll definitely see more PS4 and Xbox One games coming out this year. And we'll see Mm -hmm. more next year. I mean, look, indie devs love the Xbox One. They love the PS4 because the tools are established for them. You know, Mm -hmm. the the new gen stuff or the current gen stuff, I should say, they're still getting established. They're still getting familiar with the hardware. There's a learning curve. There is ramp up time. So getting your games out on, on PS4 still... I mean, look, it's not going to sell as well as it did last year or the year before, but it's still going to sell. So I, I do expect that we'll see a little more of that happening. It won't do. It won't be the entire generation, though. Yeah, I agree with that. Probably, as you mentioned, you know, we'll still see PlayStation Four, Xbox One games for the duration of 2021. Probably even a good portion of 2022. Indies will go beyond that. Yep. I mean, we're still having indie games released on the PlayStation Vita two years after the system was discontinued. So, I mean, it will vary indie studio to indie studio. If they're finding success on the Xbox One or the PlayStation 4 for, you know, a considerable amount of time, they'll stick with that platform. And, you know, cross-platform releases of that, you know, of that type of release could yeah for at least a few years but not the entire generation not for you know another seven years then had a five dollar donation from juro who writes hey guys love the podcast i just want to know what's your opinion on the ace attorney games they are fantastic i think they're fantastic as well (laughs) then had a four dollar and 20 cent donation from jim ryan is secretly rgt 85 (laughs) Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the serious Sam tip. It's been a great ride so far. Just finishing the first. I don't understand how I've never heard of the series before. What is your favorite? And where do you see the series going from here? I really liked Serious Sam 2. And I think they announced the Serious Sam 4. Four, didn't they? I think they did as well. I, I'm not the world's biggest Serious Sam fan, but I did like enjoy um, number two as well. It's such a weird 
series of games, but yeah, I mean, they're kind of just that guilty fun thing. I'm, I'll never forget playing Serious Sam 1, where the guy with no head and he has bombs <laughs> on his hand just runs over the hills. Like, it's pure silence. You say, ah, I was like, what? And then he shoots and blows him up. And he goes, ah, yourself. <laughs> I was like, this is the greatest game I've ever played. <laughs> it was good times, for sure. Then had a $3 donation from Rim Jayan. Oh, man. Got a lot of Jim Ryan puns today. <laughs> and they write, can you sign my petition about RGT85? He needs to be held accountable for his actions. Thanks. You guys are cool. Also, maybe the point of The Last of Us remake is to add Pedro Pascal's face to Joel to coincide with the HBO show. I believe Evan did sign that petition for RGT to be held accountable for his Balan Wonderworld non-coverage crimes as the spawn cast and that would be an interesting idea for them to do with the last of us remake i think the real motivation be behind the last of us remake is actually for naughty dog to familiarize themselves with the playstation 5 hardware yes i, I agree with that i mean when i first heard about you know the possibilities that they were looking at remaking that game the mm -hmm. first thing that struck my mind was they want to bring that and The Last of Us Part Two to the PS5 and maybe bundle it in a collection of sorts. Yes. But I guess you can't also rule out the fact that because there is a TV show, they may want to align it with the TV show, which, mm -hmm. I'm, look, I'm not saying they're going to remove Joel's texture and put in Pedro Pascal in place, but maybe they'll add some content or maybe, you know, change some content to make it more in line with the TV show. That could be a, something that they do as well. well. We'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, we saw something somewhat similar happen with Insomniac and the Spider-Man remastered for PlayStation 5 where they made Peter Parker look a little more like, um, what's the actor's name from the Spider-Man movies? Um... Uh, Tom Holland. Tom Holland, it? yes. Yeah, they made it, it, him look a little more like Tom Holland. So I could see them maybe, you know, reconfigure Joel to look a little more like Pedro Pascal. Not enough for people to be like, well, that guy looks exactly like Pedro Pascal, but maybe just a little more in tune with what the TV character could potentially look like. So that's definitely a possibility. And it would be for them to familiarize themselves with the PS5, make the game a little more appealing to the TV show audience. So there's definitely a lot of business reasons behind that remake. Then had a dollar donation from Noah J. Mead, who writes, hello, Na hello, Nate and MVG. Do you think Nintendo will, with Switch family, or with future hardware, delve into VR? It came out recently that the Labo page was removed from the Nintendo website and now redirects specifically to the VR kit. Thoughts. eventually yes i think nintendo will dabble into vr a little more but before they do vr i think nintendo will approach ar or augmented reality because augmented reality is very popular in japan and the asian markets and it's beginning to kind of take hold in western markets a bit if you watch nba games or even wrestling you see a lot of augmented reality graphics used now yep and I can see Nintendo approach augmented reality maybe a little more aggressively. VR is a tough thing. I've used VR, you know, with PlayStation VR and such. And it's fun. It's just limited. And as Nintendo has said, they want to make it a social experience. And I'm not quite sure how you make VR social in a way that Nintendo will actually embrace it in a meaningful and constructive manner. He then had a follow-up $1 donation from Noah J. Mead, who writes, Hi, Nate and MVG. I'm looking to get a VR headset, most likely the Oculus Quest 2. Do either of you own a Quest 2 and or have thoughts on the product? Thanks for all the great content. I hope to donate more in the future, but I hope this helps for now. It certainly does help. Well, I, I will say that I have a PSVR, which I haven't used in probably about two years. I like it. I just don't want to deal with the mess of cables and everything, setting it all up. 
As far <laughs> as the Oculus Quest 2, I will say that I'm thinking about getting one because when they announced Resident Evil 4 VR, yes. it did get me a little excited about it. I'm not going to lie. The last experience I had with VR was playing Resident Evil 7 on PSVR. And I loved every minute of it. I felt like it was probably the best VR experience I've had next to something like Tetris Effect, uh, which was absolutely phenomenal as well. So mm -hmm. I am thinking about getting the Quest 2. So I, I like where you're, where, you're, where you're going with this because I, I have similar thoughts. Yeah. from I know a few people who have a Quest 2 and they all speak very highly of it. And with the announcement of Resident Evil 4 VR, as MVG said, I am looking at Quest 2s right now and I want to buy one. I just look at that sticker price. I'm like, ah, yeah. do I really need it for this one game? Because yep. maybe it eventually could find its way to like a PlayStation VR. That's what I'm hoping for. You know, PSVR 2 will get it and maybe they'll get Village as well. And, and you know, that would be a pretty hype, hype kind yeah. of duo right there. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking at the Quest VR or the Quest 2, it seems as though impressions and thoughts on it are very high. And yes, your donation is greatly appreciated and it does help the channel. So we do appreciate that. Then had a dollar donation from Skatittles, who writes Balan Bargain Bin. <laughs> it is on sale for $40 already. I did see that. <laughs> then had a dollar donation from Pyra, who writes, thanks for the show. Following something I asked on the Spawncast, if Forever Entertainment aren't a good studio to do Drakengard remakes respect, respectfully and realistically, who would be? And is there actually any chance of it? I love them, but they can be rough on the edges. Forever Entertainment just feel like they are the monkey's paw of indie game publishers and developers they can get a quality franchise like panzer dragoon and they just they mess up one aspect of it where if a better studio was able to get hands of it they would do a more quality you know remake or port with the dragon guard games i mean the that's franchise for those who don't know is basically the predecessor to near yep and i'd want to see it in house I want to see an in-house remake or remaster done of Dragon Guard. Not don't hand it off to a smaller studio. Do it in-house. Do it the justice it deserves. The first game is fantastic. The second one is kind of where it began. The technical limitations became more apparent, and then I believe it was the third one that was just a mess. So it's definitely a trilogy that deserves probably a revisit. But I want them to do it in-house, commit the resources to make it, a, you know, really make it worthwhile. Don't give it to forever and just get a cheap port. I mean, Panzer Dragoon, it's accurate to the source material. But when they, they didn't implement motion controls until a patch, some of the controls were iffy when it launched. The music was good, though. Music was great. That, yeah, I mean, good. I think I think they eventually came good on the game, but you're right. I mean, it, when it first launched, it was it was a little rough around the edges, and it took a little bit of time to to you know to fix it up. It's it's mm -hmm. a fine it's a fine game. It's serviceable. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's there's just some there's an X factor that's missing that made the original so so amazing. And look, maybe it's nostalgia yeah. talking. You know, maybe it's nostalgia, but um, I do agree right. with you, Nate. Yeah, I mean, that's my only hesitation with the House of the Dead remake that they're doing. They need to get the controls down perfectly because yeah. controls are everything with the House of the Dead game. The visuals look good. It's off to a good start, but it's going to come down to those controls, and I hope they do deliver on it. And I believe they had also announced they're going to do Panzer Dragoon 2. Yep. So hopefully they have learned from that first release and they're able to expertly craft that product when it is time to launch then had a dollar donation from liam werner writes what exactly is wrong with the esa both of you have said on previous spawncast episodes that they need to change and be a better company what happened that made you guys think that maybe that could even be a filler episode for a week with no big news well aside from the doxing situation uh 
it's just a poorly run organization. They really, they became consumed with profit and money. When they, I mean, ESA, with E3, the ESA needs the publishers more than the publishers need the ESA. And the ESA charges a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars for a publisher to partake at E3. Now, you know, you could argue, why don't the publishers, you know, just do their own thing? And they have. Sony's done exactly that. The value of E3 or what ESA was charging Sony to be at E3 was no longer viable to them. They said, this isn't, we're not getting a good return on, on our investment. But the ESA's problems, it's just, it's vast. They are not a well-run company. They treated the doxing situation with no sincerity. They didn't care. Yeah, and we've covered this before. I mean, if you go back and listen to maybe um, a year ago, actually probably a little more than a year ago, so kind of just scroll back in the in the list of episodes, you'll find us talking about the ESA um, before E3 because, look, Nate, Nate is absolutely correct. Um, and at the end of the day, the ESA hasn't really changed with the times of, of video games. It's still... It's still the same approach that they've always had. And, you know, the landscape of video games has changed significantly. And I think ultimately that's, that's you know, our, our concerns, plus the doxing thing. And if you're not familiar with the doxing thing, um, I suggest you Google it because it was, it was really a bad look for them. Yeah, that was, I mean, that's one of those things that's really inexcusable and they didn't do anything to, they, their apology, nothing they did really instilled confidence in this organization. Then had a $115 donation from Wisecorn01, whom this episode is dedicated to, who writes, Eternal Darkness is a great game. Do you think they'll make a new one? And what do you think about a new Power Stone? Also, do you think Nintendo will take advantage of the Labo with House of the Dead? Also, what if Nintendo do dead vr with the power glove so first question eternal darkness is a great game i don't think we'll ever see a new one i'm not sure what developer they would give it to maybe we'll get like a hd version of the gamecube game one day yeah i could maybe see that happening but i i could also see we never hear about this game ever again yeah, there's also a good possibility of that. <laughs> uh, Power Stone in the leaked Capcom documents, they do list that a new Power Stone was in development. The only caveat that one should treat those documents with is that they had detailed games that had 2024, 2025 releases. So some of those projects likely or could potentially face cancellation. Hopefully Power Stone is not one of them. Power Stone should come back. It was a fantastic game when it was on the Dreamcast and PSP. So I hope Power Stone makes a return. Um, I'm not sure how Labo would really be utilized with House of the Dead. I'm not really sure either. Maybe some um, cardboard light gun? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not and really sure how that would work. And if Nintendo ever comes out with a game that can use the Power Glove, that would be an interesting moment. It would be. That thing was weird. <laughs> I don't even think it really functioned correctly. It was just... It wasn't very accurate as far as I know. Yeah, I believe it had a lot of problems. <laughs> and then had a $10 donation from Fly High 423 Writes, huge fan of the podcast, slowly working through the backlog of episodes. Looking for your opinion on a PlayStation Slim dilemma. My laser has failed. Do I spend $80 to fix it or hold on for hope of disc backwards compatibility on the PlayStation 5? Keep up the great work. I wouldn't hold hope for disc backward compatibility on the PlayStation 5 anytime soon. That's not to say it won't happen, but I think I feel pretty good in saying the next two years, as in between now and the end of 2022, maybe a little mm -hmm. more than that, 
Sony's focus will well and truly be on the PlayStation 5 and their up and coming VR. Yeah, I think we if we've seen in Sony introduce any backwards compatibility for PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, it would likely just be the digital games that we had access to on PlayStation 3, PlayStation Vita. So if you had them in your account, you would get them then on your PlayStation 5, but that probably won't be introduced until probably the earliest second half of 2022, maybe early 2023. Um, I mean, there's nothing in theory prohibiting Sony to go a similar route to what Microsoft has done, where you pop in like, you know, your original Xbox copy of Ninja Guide in Black and you get a digital version of the game as long as it's in the backwards compatibility, you know, roster. Yep. But it doesn't seem like it's Sony's priority right now. So an $80 fix would probably be your best idea right now based on the information available to us. And our final Streamlabs question for the week comes from Fly High 423 and it is $10. And they ask, I've been a big fan of MVG's work for years and just wanted to say congratulations on Shante. I just watched your YouTube videos on the process and I'm incredibly happy for you. I hope this may lead to more Switch games from you in the future. Cheers. Thank you. I appreciate the kind words. And yes, there will be more. I don't really know when and where at this time but there will be more that's what i'll say at this point and nate the hate exclusive <laughs> mvg will have more switch games coming out there you go you heard it here first guys that's right so i want to see this on reddit game rant <laughs> reset era reset era every outlet out there better run the story right now shanti developer promises more switch games <laughs> I'll, I'll just edit this part out Ah, uh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and today's episode, once again, is dedicated to Wisecorn01. Thank you for your donation of $115 and your generosity for supporting our channel and to all the other Streamlabs that were made for today's episode. Thank you all for your generosity and support. We greatly appreciate it. And I'd like to thank my co-host, MVG, for joining me as always. Thanks for having me on, Nate. It's great, uh, great to be back. I know we've been off for a couple of weeks, but I'm glad to be back doing this. And stay tuned, audience, because we've got a lot more coming up. Yes, we do. We have lots of content planned, and we have some special guests planned as well when we have certain topics coming up. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, let us know your thoughts on Nintendo's upcoming fiscal year data report in the comment section below. We will have an episode dissecting and deep diving Nintendo's fiscal report next week once it becomes public. And until next time, continue to embrace the hate. <laughs> <laughs>